Hello and thanks for tuning in. Jamie Hall, Definitive Imaging here and today I am going to finally do my first YouTube tutorial. Uh, surprise, surprise, it is on macro photography and focus stacking. Focus stacking is something that comes up a lot in terms of questions for a lot of the community, myself included. Uh, I don't think that's actually too much content out there in terms of step-by-step -step guides and tips and tricks so I've put myself in the uh, studio and that's exactly what I'm gonna do I'm gonna try and give a bit of a, a basic overview getting a bit more advanced as we go on into focus stacking and I'll break this down into multiple videos so this first video is gonna be concentrating on just the practical side so getting the shots um, different considerations and different scenarios different settings and um, getting those images and making sure that you're starting off at a good point. I'm then going to look at some processing in the second video, uh, different software that I use, different tips and tricks again for, for the initial stack and then I'm hoping at the end to do like an advanced video which will cover some of the more specific in particular and nuanced photoshopping that I do that is quite specific for macro editing and the stacking in terms of the stuff that comes up um, and also want to look at things like comparing the DSLR to the mirrorless so I started off on my Canon 5D and now I do most of my macro on my OM system EM1X so talk about sort of the manual side and some of the more um, auto side and how this can help in some of those comparisons as well so uh, if you want to get into stacking and macro then hopefully this is the video for you and I hope you enjoy it So first things first, what is focus stacking? It's quite a simple concept really, uh, with macro and certainly high magnification photography, your depth of field is gonna be very narrow or your focus plane is gonna be very, very thin. I.e. you're gonna have a super small slither that is gonna be in focus and a lot of your foreground and background is gonna be out of focus. And this just comes with the fact that you're super close to the subject most of the time. If you're on a wide angle landscape, obviously you have the opposite effect, nice big wide angle, everything's in focus. And even with your eyes, you know, if you get close to something, the background starts to blur. With macro, a lot of the, certainly the insects, but also things like flowers and moss and slime, um, you really want to get lots of those details and, and you just can't get that in one shot unless you're very far away when you're very far away you're going to sacrifice in detail and resolution so the perfect scenario is getting nice and close adding some diffuse light onto it or any other additional light because also when you get magnification you're letting light less light into the lens so you really need to add a lot of light which is why you'll see a lot of cameras with diffusers um, you can use constant light you can use natural light on like a slow shutter speed on tripods and some people do that but generally good rule of thumb is to be using a diffuser for this example, I have a little spider on, it's not an alive spider, it's a toy spider, on my plamp. So just studio conditions, but it'll make it nice and easy for me to give an example. And quite simply, if I want to take a photo of this spider, and I'm just gonna go classically for the eyes. Spiker, I'll take a picture of the eyes. You can see that the eyes are in focus, but the rest of the uh, subject is not in focus. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a picture of the very front of the legs and I'm going to physically move closer and closer so that my focus point moves with me through the subject. I have this on manual focus, I pretty much always have it on manual focus for uh, macro and certainly with the DSLR. Um, but this is only like an inch long okay maybe a couple of inches so if i wanted to take 20 or 30 shots or if i need 20 or 30 shots i'm going to be moving only that inch for that 30 shots so i'm moving like a 30th of an inch each time so what that will look like is going to be like this over exaggerated but i'm going to come through and capture all of these parts so you can do this in a couple of different ways. Um, generally with a DSLR, I tended to do it quite slowly. So often I would be manually pressing the button and going through. I know a lot of people have used um, the higher speed. So you can come through and again, 
and you can go that way um, I found that especially with my flash power was a bit higher that I was losing images because my flash couldn't keep up so just that manual time gave a bit of um, extra flash recycle time but the concept is very much the same pushing through the images taking those images So some important considerations. Uh, one of the most important things about trying to get that initial stack is being stable. If you have a subject that is on a bush or on a tree or on a leaf and there's little winds and you can anchor down, then you're gonna be laughing. If you're gonna to struggle to find anything to lean on, say a spider on a web um, and there's nothing to lean on, trying to stack midair and you know trying to stay perfectly still without anything to lean on is really really hard feat i would say that i fail you know 80 percent if not more stacks of, of stuff if i'm not anchored or stable so the first sort of main trick is to over egg it really over exaggerate if you have something like this uh, and I'm in the field, you know, if I have a stick or I've taken a leaf from a branch and, and I do have a plamp or a way to lay it down before I had a plamp, I would just have the leaf and I would lay it on the ground and I would go prone. I would lay down absolutely prone. So I've got my hands super steady on the ground. I've got my head super steady. Like everything is just really, really stable. If I don't have the luxury of uh, laying on the ground because the subject won't allow or for whatever reason then I'm looking for something else to lean on obviously in this setting in the studio I can lean on the desk um, but I'm also looking for trees to lean on so I'm, I'm often if I'm shooting something on a tree like I'm leaning against the tree bodies on the tree and like as much of me as possible is taking my weight especially if I want to get multiple stacks you know this is a really cool subject I don't just want to try and stack it once I want to try different angles I want to try from the top from the front I want to try a wider stack so I'm getting the whole body in maybe I want to get in really close and just get that portrait stack either way if I'm really comfortable for one of those or really uncomfortable for one of those it's just going to deteriorate so it's fatiguing like when you're taking that many photos and you're tensing your whole body up expect to be tired like it's going to be a bit of a workout um, not in the classic sense of the word but you know I'm, I'm holding my breath a lot of the time and super tense if it's a really like interesting subject I am holding my breath and I am just and really going for it you know really making sure that I'm not um, leaving any stones unturned I, I often joke that when I started in macro my photos and my stacks were some of the best I'd ever been because I was so determined seeing what other people could do that I really like went hard on it and the later and later I got in my uh, macro career sort of the more complacent I was I was like yeah I can do this I can boss it and then I would get back and have really messy stacks and spend just countless hours trying to fix them and that's the main key if you can get good clean stacks in camera and you can get yourself stable and your stacks are good, you will save yourself so much time in the back end. There is nothing worse than finding that subject you really want to find and then you have to spend hours and hours processing it or trying to get it right. And if you don't have that capability and that sort of Photoshop prowess um, or the right software, you're going to struggle even more. So, you know, you can spend an hour trying to do something and it still isn't good. And when you're taking 10, 20, 30 stacks in a session, if every single one of them is taking an hour to process, you know, there's just not enough time in the day. So getting a stable stack is just like the bread and butter. Uh, you're not always gonna be able to do that. Like I said, things on webs, things flying, things skittish, you're not always gonna have the opportunity. But if you do, overdo it. When I started to learn about focus bracketing or focus stacking in camera, like what the OMD, uh, OM system has, it, it kind of stood to reason that that wasn't working via proximity. That was working via changing the focal point within the lens. So the, the lens is actually focusing itself going further down. 
So I was curious, like I hadn't really done any focus ring stuff when I first started, I had asked a couple of questions, but I wanted to do some field tests for using the focus ring. And what that means is I'm gonna be in the same position and I'm gonna focus on the furthest point back and I'm just going to twist the ring as I take shots. Now, this is really finite. Um, the movement that I do with my fingers is super, super, uh, subtle and again because uh, I'm having to physically move this my grip on the camera becomes a bit more complicated so I've got to find a way to have my fingers and th or my finger and thumb being able to twist this but also a good enough grip on the camera and the lens so that I'm stable this is complicated this takes a little bit of practice but when it comes good um, you're going to be able to stay in that position and you're going to be able to twist this ring and feel nice and stable. What you get for this, for my money, is much more consistent and cleaner stacks. One of the main reasons is when you're pushing and using the push method, you're so much more susceptible to your camera twisting to your camera tilting and all this sorts of movement in your images when you come through to process them are going to cause different distortions and the sort of AI of the stacking software is going to struggle to compensate for it. So keeping the camera is as sort of squared on to the subject is hugely important and with the focus ring methods as, as I have said it's so much easier to be stable. You are taking out all of this sort of twist most of the time and you're just in one position and... So you can see, uh, it's, it's a bit more comfortable. Um, it's a little easier to execute. And when I started using the focus ring method, I found that my stacks lined up just so much easier. Like I almost didn't need to do anything in terms of that first blend. Uh, normally <clears throat> when I was using the proximity, I'd always find there was a distortion, something had moved. I'd have to sort of paint different things in and out on the software, which we'll get to later. But generally with that focus ring method, it was just a dream. And there are different uh, things that occur with the focus ring that again we'll go into later but I would recommend trying to get comfortable with it. A lot of the sort of success in macro photography is versatility right so you want to be able to shoot things in flight because you're going nice and quick you want to be able to shoot things that are moving quite a lot and following with them you might be in situations where you can do the push method where you can only do the focus ring method because moving is going to disturb so giving yourself different tools for different subjects um, is just going to work uh, for you really well and pay dividends so I would recommend getting comfortable with the focus ring method, give it a little try out. Um, if you're already focus stacking and you're sort of a seasoned stacker uh, and not tried it, give it a try. Um, I think you'll be really surprised at how clean your stacks come out. And generally, just in terms of a workflow and the processing time, it saved me loads of time. So that focus ring method ended up becoming my default. I used it a lot more than I did the push method. So another technique uh, that you'll see a lot of macro photographers using is sort of taking some of this tilt and spin out of the equation by trying to keep the subject and the camera in the same position. So if you have a subject on a leaf or a twig, something like that, and it's nice and chilled and calm, let's say I want to get a top down stack of this subject, I can hold it in one hand, whatever feels comfortable, and I can brace myself on my lens and what this means is no matter sort of how I move and the camera moves theoretically I should have a very little or at least a reduced amount of motion because it should all move in tandem but I'm very often going to be doing this exact same thing so coming in here and and again the, the only movement I'm really I'm essentially doing this either moving the, the my thumb close to the subject or the subject close to the camera however you want to name it but 
but that again will just negate a lot of the sort of different movements going on it also means it's really easy to change your background so I have this little back sheet up here which I did show you so if I take a picture on this pink sheet you can see I've got a nice pink background but then I can move and face into it where it's nice and green outside and I can get a green background so I can change my backgrounds and go up to the sky try and get some light coming through so it's again just going to add uh, a lot of variance in terms of what I'm going to see and what I'm going to be able to do when I have that ability to move the subject around and change the background. Okay, so there are going to be some other considerations and things for you to think about when you're focus stacking. One of them is, as I said, overcompensation, over exaggeration again. A lot of the time when I am processing an image, I'm not necessarily stacking the entire body from the very front to the very back. Sometimes it can look really good. Uh, sometimes it suits the sort of scene very well, but often uh, it can sort of look 2D, quite flat the image. So you have to find a good composition, but what I'll often do is look to have a bit of focus fall off at the back section of the subject, just because it looks a bit more natural. What that means in terms of how I'm setting up my shots and focus stacking just because I'm going to make that decision later potentially doesn't mean that I generally shoot that way in camera. What I'm doing in camera is pretty much always shooting before and after the point of the subject. So what that means is rather than just going to that first point and starting there, I'm always going to start a couple of frames further back closer so everything is out of focus. The reasons for this are, are quite simple and especially when you get smaller. The smaller you get, the smaller the subject, the higher the magnification, the smaller the increments uh, that you're going to need to get that stack in terms of um, the movement. You may stack the same number of shots but the, the movement becomes more and more subtle. So if you go on that first little bit of the leg and you move you know a millimeter half a millimeter as you take the shot you'll miss that first frame uh, and that's just absolutely terrible and you know i always recommend checking the back of the camera hey so you, if you've taken 10 20 images i'm gonna go i'm gonna zoom in yeah and i'm just gonna work through the image and make sure that I've got that all there but it can be really easy especially if you're doing multiple stacks especially with something like the the OM system camera when I'm going tat 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 it'd be really easy to just miss one frame of that and if you've got sort of the best stack and the best frame or something really cool is happening and you just miss that first slither or that last slither like it can really like just ruin a shot it can again be painstaking in terms of trying to recover it you maybe you have to get stuff off different frames or it could just go in the bin so um, always overcompensate start in front of the subject and finish at the end once I have say these 30 images and I take them into my laptop to do some processing I don't have to stack all 30 I can just stack the first 20 and find that sweet spot where the focus fall off looks nice and for a spider for example having that face in and everything front of the face looks really nice and then often leaving the background or and the abdomen out of focus for that focus fall off so I'll process both of them 120 130 and see what looks better maybe that 20 actually looks better at 19 and I'll take another frame off but covering all the bases making sure that you've got everything there that consistency uh, will really give you a lot more freedom and help to cover up any mistakes when you're moving around I don't want to go too heavy into settings, um, but I have sort of given uh, a lot of points on focus stacking and then missed out or sort of not gone heavy into some of the settings details, which is obviously quite key. Uh, I've told you what my go-to setup or settings is for my DSLR. It's pretty similar. Um, 
for the um, OM system as well but you just gotta find that sweet spot for me F8 is gonna be sort of the go-to if I've got a very very still subject and I know that I can stay still enough to get lots of images then I will bring the aperture down I've gone down as low as 3.5 um, but that's pretty challenging again you'll get a really buttery background at 3.5 but you know f5 f5.6 is pretty achievable for a medium-sized subject that's very very willing um, but then also having that versatility versatility to go the opposite way so something like ants jumping spiders like I was saying the really small stuff uh, even if you get like a one or two stack at a higher at a high aperture or a narrow aperture should I say um, like f14 f15 f16 like you really can push it you're gonna have to add more light and compensate again either with your ISO or with the light um, to get those but if you get a two shot at f14 on an ant or a spider then you are getting double the amount of detail if you've sort of moved in that increment well enough so uh, again versatility and sort of knowing your subject and the settings and the camera and being able to be adaptive you know f8 f10 good place to start for most things but you know don't be afraid to start to get you know more sharpness by going um, a bit wider on your aperture and finding that sweet spot depending on the camera the lens and don't be afraid to get a bit more distortion and a bit more diffraction um, and a bit more noise by pushing the earth um, by pushing the aperture uh, a bit narrower to get that better field of view and just putting the flash power up you know even for singles a lot of the time if I'm sure my subject isn't going to be harmed um, or stressed out, I will put my flash power quite high, 1 over 4, 1 1.2 and f16 and just try and get some singles. Um, so, you know, the flash power, which I haven't really talked about too much, does change a lot on the Canon uh, around about 1 over 16, 1 over 8 power was my go-to most of the time. Whereas on the OM system, because I'm looking to do generally a lot more deeper stacks and to really take that flash to its limit um, I'm able to go to uh, 1 over 32 um, for most of my stacking here so because I want that uh, non-stop recycle for the flash I generally have this uh, starting point of 1 over 32 because I know it can go pretty limitless and then I'm changing my settings on the camera to compensate for the flash or to sort of work in the same area as the flash so you know there is no secret sauce uh, like everything in photography you're going to have to find the sweet spots find what works and having that knowledge uh, before you go to the field or building it before you go into the field again is just going to help give you a lot a better success rate you know I'm going to walk towards a subject that I see and I'm going to know uh, what my flash power is, what my aperture is, what my ISO is, all my settings and I'm going to have it ready before I come in close. I know that if I get to close proximity it might fly away. So you really want to be able to get everything right and take a photo. Take a photo of your hands, like it's a really sort of bright thing. So especially for shiny, such shiny subjects it can work quite well, but you know, test your settings out. Okay, there's something over there that's really cool. Just do a quick test shot, you know, make sure that's all good. Yeah, that's gonna work fine. And get that test shot out of the way rather than missing that one opportunity. You know, build yourself up and set yourself up for success rather than failure. And just again, that hit rate and the consistency will help you get a lot more shots for sure. Okay, so we're going to move on now. Uh, I'm going to get rid of my DSLR and I'm going to pick up my Olympus or OM Systems, previously Olympus, EM1X. Now, what the Olympus has is a rather cool bit of technology called bracketing or focus bracketing. And what this means is it is essentially using the focus ring method, but I don't have to use the focus ring manually. It will do it itself. So quite simply, with a click of a button on the Olympus, 
If I choose the front of the legs, I press the button once and it goes. I don't even have to do anything. Just that, just that one feature makes the world a difference. Again, in terms of what I was saying about stability, now I'm not having to push forward, so I'm not having to move, just having to stay perfectly still. In terms of the stacks for my money, it's gonna line up easier and better, because again, I'm not tilting and moving. But also just the ease of not having to do anything. I'm not manually pressing the button, I'm not manually moving this, I'm not manually moving that. And the speed is quick, like, so that was on sort of a slower setting. So if I go to the faster setting on this, and again, come in for the focus, press the button once. It's, it's done it. It's, it's done the whole thing super quickly, much quicker than my Canon 5D. So that's why uh, a lot of people are moving on to the OM system. Just the ability to be able to bracket gives you such a better hit rate and everything about macro for me is about success rates about hit rates uh, you, you often get so such a small amount of time to capture a subject you know whether it's a spider or a fly or an ant you know all of these things they're moving fast they're small they're skittish like you don't you don't always get the chance to be this close and super and nice and sometimes you do and that's absolutely great but sometimes you just don't so having that ability to be able to go literally fresh on the scene all right subject first attempt right bang nailed it like first attempt I'm generally going to be able to get a lot more from that. I think it's just made like a, a world of difference to my photography. I do get less resolution. When I look at the stacks that I did on this uh, 5D from like a year ago and the resolution, like they are like heavenly. Um, this is only a 30 megapixel um, sensor, whereas this is a 20. It's not a huge amount of difference, but you know, when I've nailed like a 30, 40 stack with that compared to this, there is a noticeable difference and uh, I, I do miss that but just the lightness and the ability to be able to get those stacks quickly and um, you also get a slightly sort of wider depth of field because it's micro four thirds so your single shots are going to have just a bit more depth um, compared to the full frame where you just get a bit more um, bokeh and a bit more of the uh, that butteriness so for singles it works really well as well um, and there's obviously whole different uh, advantages between mirrorless and DSLR but just talking about stacking itself um, the Olympus or the OM system previously Olympus has um, really really changed the game for me and do a bit more talking about some of the uh, OM system stuff so this is going to be more likely for um, Mac photographers who are already a little bit deeper in their career, as it were, who are already sort of with OM because they want to do bracketing, not definitely, but there's a few different tips um, for this system, which again is gonna help you with that success rate. Um, most importantly, uh, for me, the first thing I did with this camera when I picked it up was set up some custom modes. I can do this with the Canon, but it's a bit more of a manual process. So with this, what I want is I want to be able to, in the same way, approach my subject and just be able to click that button and know that I'm going to get what I want and to cover all the bases. So with the focus bracketing, the way that this works, you can manually set up uh, your intervals or differential uh, of the bracketing. So at point one, it's going to be the thinnest margin and at 10, you're gonna have sort of a big gap between the images. If you have it at point one, then, you know, something like, you know, this spider, for example, let's say it takes 120 shots at point one, which is gonna be a lot. If you're at point two, you're going to reduce that drastically and it's going to take a lot less shots to do it. And then at point three, etc., etc. So again, it's about understanding your subject and what is going to be the best attack for that subject. If I am approaching something quite big, let's say a big fat grasshopper again, um, 
I'm going to go for my focus differential of two or three because I know that I don't need that absolute precision. I also don't need that highest number of shots and uh, maybe I'll have it on a slower recycle time so that I don't have to worry about the flash cutting out. What I will often do when I find a subject that I like, so let's say I've found this spider, the first thing I'll do um, will be uh, not do any bracketing or any focus stacking and I will just walk up and I will take a reference shot so I just want that single one uh, I found something that's cool I haven't seen it before I'm just going to get a shot I'm probably going to have a slightly higher aperture so that I'm getting a bit more detail so my again my standard um, settings for the single is going to be probably around about f9 f10 and about 100 on my shutter speed and I'm just gonna quickly get in a couple of singles nice and far away get a little bit closer cool I got it I got a shot something I can collect something that I can have in my library it's just a reference shot some people are like really into reference shots some people don't really care but I'm always going for a quick reference shot first once I've got that reference shot I'm now going to go for sort of the stacking light or the stacking skinny version and go to my C2. So you have custom one, two, three, four on this camera and you can set up different buttons, different custom buttons. So as you can see, it's got some buttons on the front here. It's got some buttons on the bottom here. You've got buttons on the back and a lot of these buttons can be customized to jump into one of your custom modes. So I have it as standard on my manual. Take the reference shot. Cool. Now I'm going to press this button up here and this is going to go to custom two, which is my point two differential. It's going to be slightly slower, but I know that I'm going to probably be able to stack that spider in this instance top down in like five to ten images. So again, I'm going to get it nice and simple, nice and quick, the quickest way possible to get it. It's not going to be perfect. It's not going to be the best version that I can get, but it will give me a stack nice and quick. So I'm going to come and I'm going to go custom to one button I've pressed for custom to Bang, got it, top down, perfect. And again, cool, got it on custom two. Now I wanna try and get a bit closer or I want more details. Now I'm gonna to go to my custom one, which is gonna be 0.1 focus differential. So tiny, tiny margins. It's all because they're gonna be a lot faster as well. So my flash would have to come to one over 32 as a minimum to, to make sure that it's got enough recycle time. But then I can come in and I can get some of those closer details. I did also have the C3 set up as well, um, again for even bigger subjects. Uh, but I found that it was a little inconsistent and wasn't quite enough. I know that other people have used a differential of three. Uh, and I obviously am correlating my custom C123 to the differential just because that's sort of made sense to me so in one button push again i am ready for each subject the custom mode is also set up to um, play into the hands of the differential as well so my shutter speed and not the shutter speed because with a flash it, it only goes to one over 50 on the system but um, my aperture um, is going to change for that, that differential as well. So at the two, I'm going to have a bit higher. Again, just want to make sure I'm getting that shot. And then once I'm going to C1, I'm going to go on this camera and this lens. Uh, I, it defaults to 5.6, which is just sort of the sweetest sharp spot for this lens. So that just means I'm going to get, you know, the best bang for my buck. And uh, sometimes I'm using C2, sometimes I'm using C1, sometimes I'm using both. It's just gonna depend on my subject and the opportunity. Okay, so just some final thoughts. Uh, most importantly, practice. Practice is gonna make perfect, like everything forever, always. Uh, practice on still subjects, uh, autumn and winter, great time to find fungi and other cool things that are going to stay still find flowers find tiny little like imperfections on leaves find something in your house that's like super weird you know uh, like peppercorn something really small 
rather than stressing yourself out trying to go straight for you know one of the hardest things like an ant to try and stack in the world which you're just going to really struggle with find easy things transition into uh easy invertebrates or insects to shoot spiders are a great idea especially if they are on the wall and quite still and if you don't have a phobia of them one of the reasons why a lot of people shoot spiders is because they're really willing subjects they're not freaked out very much they generally stay still quite easily um, and they're just really good subject to practice on um, anything that's not like flying away super easily or jumping out of the way um, some grasshoppers uh, things that are bigger in size uh, also are going to be um, sort of easier to stack because your margin for error is going to be smaller again the smaller you go the smaller the increments if you've got something bigger you're further away you've got more depth of field uh, and you can have just more margin for error there so start on the easier things get some practice in and then you know start to challenge yourself on on something small like you know jumping spiders and <laughs> if you're brave enough and <laughs> So um, for this uh, episode, that's going to be it. Um, I could go honestly on for hours and hours on this. When I first thought about doing this video, I, I thought about a really long format video where it was just finite details and really, really going hard on it. But I just don't think people want to consume something that long. Maybe if you're super passionate, but I want this to have lots of little information um, for you to be able to go out and get stuff and improve and have the tools you need to start practicing so um, I spread it a little bit thin but there's still a lot of stuff in there I could talk about how to set custom modes on both of them and go into the menus but there will be other videos for that not from me but from other youtubers and you can find that stuff out easily so anything that's sort of not been covered uh, hopefully it should be easy for you to go and find out how to do that part of it but in terms of the shortcuts and the little tips and tricks that will just give you again just a better hit rate a better chance at capturing your subject and uh, just not doing things the long way hey doing things the most efficient way and it's the same with my editing that i will go into the the, the next part of the process i take a lot of photos i process a lot of photos and for me it's all about um, streamlining your workflow from the start in camera all the way through to the end the quickest way that I can get to a good desirable shot just means that I can get more of them so I'm constantly looking uh, for the shortcuts and for any sort of time I can shave off or any efficiencies that I can get in there so if you have um, any sort of comments or questions then feel free to drop it below uh, if you like this video and you're keen to see the next one give it a like um, definitely subscribe I've never actually asked for likes or subscriptions but everyone does it so I should probably be doing it so please uh, subscribe share do whatever you want to do and if this video has been helpful for you uh, please let me know thanks for listening to me rabbit on for this long and hopefully you'll tune in for the next video until next time cheers